Hi everyone, welcome back to this short tutorial from Pathology Made Simple at ilopathology.com and supported by this amazing AI based study tool called Wisdolia. At the end of this session, I will be posting the link for practice sessions via Wisdolia for you to solve them. So, in continuation with the autoimmune diseases, we were discussing about rheumatoid arthritis, right? In my earlier session, I talked about the etiopathogenesis of rheumatoid arthritis. Now, it's time to learn the morphology and clinical features of rheumatoid arthritis. We will also look into the lab diagnosis and treatment aspects of rheumatoid arthritis. Now, we know that rheumatoid arthritis typically affects small joints of hands and feet where the synovium is edematous, thickened and hyperplastic. Grossly, it appears as if it is covered by delicate and bulbous villi. Normally, the contour of you know, joint uh, space or the joint surface is very smooth. Whereas, in the case of rheumatoid arthritis, it is seen as villous protrusion of the synovial tissue. Now, let's look into the features on microscopy. For that, we need to know what and how the normal joint looks like. Look at that. That's the cartilage. The blue one is the cartilage. This is the joint space. This is the synovial membrane lined by a single layer of synoviocytes. That is the capsule of the joint, right? So, microscopically, the findings of rheumatoid arthritis include, the most important one is the hyperplasia of the synovial lining okay that is synovial hyperplasia look at this it's just a single lining now you see multi layering of the synovial epithelium so that's synovial hyperplasia and also you see lots and lots of inflammatory cells along with fibroblasts the lymphocytes plasma cells macrophages dendritic cells and neutrophils okay because we know that there is t and b cell activation leading on to accumulation of all these inflammatory cells. If you are here for the first time, I would suggest you to go back and watch my video on etiopathogenesis. As I told you, you have fibroblast proliferation as well. And then it, there is also vascular proliferation, wherein you find lots of these delicate thin-walled blood vessels. And the whole tissue is now referred to as panis. Okay. And this panis eventually will erode the underlying bone and can cause subchondral cysts. And while, while discussing about the pathogenesis, I also told that there is activation of osteoclast leading on to erosion of bone surface, right? Which finally leads to bone resorption. So, just summarizing, we see that there is synovial cell hyperplasia and proliferation. We see lots of dense inflammatory infiltrates and sometimes lymphoid follicles which predominantly include the CD4 positive helper T cells, B cells, plasma cells, dendritic cells and macrophages. Increased vascularity is seen that's because of angiogenesis. There can be fibrinopurulent exudate both in the synovial tissue as well as on the joint surfaces. And as I told you, there will be osteoclastic activity in the subchondral bone. The whole thing is now referred to as panus, right? The osteoclastic activity in the subchondral bone, penetration of inflamed synovium and leading on to erosion of periarticular leading on to subchondral cysts. So, this is the illustration of microscopic features what you find in rheumatoid arthritis. As I mentioned, the panis is basically a mass of edematous synovium which consists of inflammatory cells, granulation tissue and fibroblast which leads to erosion of articular cartilage. Right? And once there is destruction of articular cartilage, sometimes the panis can bridge the opposing bones leading on to ankylosis. And this ankylosis is because of increased fibrous tissue proliferation. That is why it is referred to as fibrous ankylosis, which can ossify leading on to bony fusion, bony ankylosis. So, as we mentioned earlier, rheumatoid arthritis can eventually progress to destruction of articular cartilage and finally leading on to bony ankylosis or fusion of joints. Now, some of these patients can have rheumatoid nodules. What are these? They are basically small nodules which can be seen in the subcutaneous tissue of the forearm, elbows, occiput and lumbosacral areas which are small firm masses. They are usually non-tender and round to oval masses. These are rheumatoid nodules which on microscopy basically is a necrotizing granuloma. 
Now, what is necrotizing granuloma? In the center, you have fibrinoid necrosis because we saw, because earlier we have learned that fibrinoid necrosis is almost always immune in origin, right? So, there is central zone of fibrinoid necrosis surrounded by rim of activated macrophages, which is usually in palisading pattern. You know, you also find lots of new lymphocytes and plasma cells as inflammatory infiltrates. So, this necrotizing granuloma with palisaded macrophages is characteristic of rheumatoid nodule. The other features of rheumatoid arthritis include leukocytoclastic vasculitis where there is acute necrotizing vasculitis of small and large arteries which can involve the pleura, pericardium and lung which eventually evolve into a chronic fibrosing process. The leukocytoclastic vasculitis in the skin is manifested as purpura, cutaneous ulcers and nail bed infarction. The ocular involvement in rheumatoid arthritis is in the form of uveitis and keratoconjunctivitis. Clinically, 50% of patients, the disease manifests or disease begins as malaise, fatigue and generalized musculoskeletal pain. After a few weeks or few months, there will be joint involvement which is often symmetrical as I mentioned. It affects the small joints before the larger ones usually develop in the hands and feet. You know? Most often, the metacarpophalangeal and proximal interphalangeal joints, okay? followed in decreasing frequency by the wrists, ankles, elbows and finally, knee joint involvement. See, so the joint involvement is swollen, warm and painful. It has a chronic waxing and waning course. There is something called acute onset rheumatoid arthritis which occurs in around 10% of patients where the symptoms are very very severe. It is polyarticular involvement that develops over span of just few days. Sometimes the joint involvement can also lead to inflammation in tendons, ligaments and occasionally adjacent skeletal muscle which accompany the involvement of joints. In long-standing cases, there can be characteristic radial deviation of the wrist and ulnar deviation of the fingers which is referred to as swan neck deformity. Look at that. So, that is the swan neck deformity which can be seen in cases of rheumatoid arthritis. The second important you know, clinical finding includes flexion hyperextension of the fingers which is known as boutonniere deformity. So, that is the flexion. This is hyperextension and this is a flexion. So, flexion hyperextension deformity is known as boutonniere deformity. So, you remember Swan neck deformity and Bottonier deformity are one of the you know clinical features which is identified in rheumatoid arthritis. Now, how do you diagnose rheumatoid arthritis? Radiological examination, you can find joint effusions in early stages. There can be juxta-articular osteopenia with erosions, particularly when the panus invades the bony tissue. Over a period of time, there will be narrowing of the joint space and loss of articular cartilage. You know, that's the beginning of fibrous ankylosis and finally, it can fuse forming bony ankylosis. Serologically, you have to demonstrate ACPA, anti-citrullinated protein antibodies. That's the specific for rheumatoid arthritis, right? Now, how do you treat these patients? The principle of treat, see, there is no permanent cure for rheumatoid arthritis. The principle of treatment is basically to relieve the pain and inflammation and slowing or arresting the destruction of the joints. That's That should be the principle. That's brought about by you know, administering corticosteroids or immunosuppressants such as methotrexate and most notably tumor necrosis factor antagonists. Sometimes patients treated with TNF antagonists you know, long term, they can, you know, they, these patients can predispose to infection with opportunistic infections, particularly mycobacterium tuberculosis. So, that's all about the morphology, clinical features, lab diagnosis and treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. With this, I have completed the topic on rheumatoid arthritis. Watch my earlier video for etiopathogenesis. Now, if you want to know how you have understood this topic, I would suggest you to click on the practice session in the pinned comment. This is via Visdolia where you can attempt solving multiple choice questions and also short answers and also clinical based scenarios. The best part of you know attempting these questions is that you get instant feedback if you go wrong and I feel it's fun to learn this way. So, don't forget to click on the link below.
so that's all for today thank you for watching if you have liked this video hit the like button do comment don't forget to subscribe if you feel this video useful and do share in my next session i will be discussing another important autoimmune disease that is swagrain syndrome till then take care bye, -bye.